hi guys welcome back to my channel if this is your first time welcome go ahead and hit up that subscribe button for me thank you so much so you guys over the past six months rolling stone conducted dozens of interviews with diddy's former friends acquaintances employees and bad boy artists as well as industry insiders out of 300 plus people contacted for this investigation more than 50 were willing to speak about the experiences several would do so only off the record citing a fear of retribution some requested compensations in exchange for their stories rolling stone does not pay for interviews many decline to participate wanting to distance themselves from Diddy. I'm trying to leave that part of my life behind me, says one former employee. This investigation is very detailed, so I'm going to do my best to give you all the important facts. So Diddy attended Howard University in 1987, and he left after his sophomore year. Diddy was born with a short fuse. He told Jet Magazine he earned his nickname as a kid because he would always huff and puff when he got mad. I had a temper. That's why my friends started calling me Puffy, he said. His mom, Janice, a former kindergarten teacher, described him as a ham, a hot A-S-S -S mess, so a hot mess. Diddy barely knew his father, Melvin, a handsome drug dealer working for a Harlem kingpin. He was M-worded in 1972 at the age of 33 when Diddy was just a toddler. Diddy was already a predator while he was in college. Women described previously unreported incidents involving unwanted touching and fits of rage. One woman says she kept as far away as possible after Diddy caressed her back without warning and asked if she, if she would be willing to meet one of his friends. Another former student recalled that Diddy flew off the handle after she objected to him cutting a cafeteria line. A third former student recalls how the future mogul would tap on the window of an English class to get a girlfriend to ditch. The visits became noticeably unwelcome. She would tense up when Diddy appeared. The student who sat next to the women in class recalls he just had a weird control thing. I felt like she was fearful. The classmate says her concerns were validated when Diddy appeared outside the school's dorm and started screaming in a belligerent manner for his girlfriend to come outside. The classmate says other women soon began running through the halls, knocking on doors in a panic. They were sounding the alarm that Diddy, known then by his nickname Puff, was attacking the young women outside. Puff is out here acting crazy. He's beating her, the fellow student said, according to the classmate. He screamed and hollered and acted a stone fool until she came downstairs. Another Howard student who witnessed the alleged attack tells Rolling Stones. She says Combs used what appeared to be a belt to strike the young women all over the place. The witness said Diddy appeared super angry and was screaming at the top of his lungs. She says he whooped her butt, like really whooped her butt. The witness says the woman was clearly terrorized. She was trying to defend herself a little bit. She was crying and we were telling him, get off of her. We were screaming for her. A third source also recalled the alleged assault to Rolling Stone. The women at the center of the alleged attack declined to comment. Diddy was hell-bent on breaking into the music industry. He kept bugging Heavy D. You know, they were neighbors at the time in Mount Vernon. Heavy D hooked them up with the interview. And Diddy dropped out of college to work at Uptown Records full-time. Diddy 
predatory instincts resurface, according to the sexual assault lawsuit filed by Joy Dickerson Neal last November. Dickerson Neal acted opposite Diddy in a 1990 music video and received what she considered a warning from Bronx rapper Sister Soldier to keep her distance, giving his infamous reputation. Sister Soldier did not reply to a request for comment. Dickerson Neal says she reluctantly agreed to a dinner date with Diddy in January 1991 while she was a college student paying for her studies with a restaurant job. Wary of being alone with him, she requested they dine where she worked. She alleged Diddy spiked her drink when she used the restroom and later pressured her into taking a hit of a blunt. She says her legs went rubbery a short time later and that Diddy awed her at a nearby residence. She also claims Diddy filmed the attack and showed the video to others like a trophy. Through a rep, Diddy denied the allegations at the time. Mike Nice Lewis, who worked with Dickerson Neal at the short-lived PMD Records, tells Rolling Stone that she confided in him at the office about the alleged sexual assault in the early 1990s. Diddy and Bad Boy came up in conversation, and Lewis says Dickerson Neal's demeanor abruptly changed. Lewis claims Dickerson Neal told him that she had a very bad sexual experience with Diddy, keeping her head down as she talked. I believe Joy, he says. I just knew from what she was telling me that it still affected her, even two years later. Within hours of Dickerson Neal filing her complaint, another woman sued Diddy for all word. Lee Liza Gardner claims she was 16 in 1990 when she and a friend met Diddy in Uptown Singer songwriter Erin Hall at an MCA Records event in Manhattan. Gardner alleged the men were very flirtatious and handsy, feeding the girls drinks and inviting them to Hall's residence for an after party. She alleges Combs offered her more alcohol at Hall's home in New Jersey and forced her into SEX despite her protests while she was still shocked and traumatized trying to get dressed. Hall allegedly barged into the room, penned her down, and all word her too. Gardner claims an irate Combs later showed up where she was staying and began choking her until she almost passed out. Combs, a.k.a. Diddy, feared the women would tell his girlfriend what he and Aaron Hall had done. The lawsuit claims his girlfriend at the time, I believe, was Mesa Hilton, his first baby mother. Diddy's legal team denied Garner's allegations, calling them a money grab. But another woman who says she was with Garner that night of the alleged attack confirmed many details of Garner's lawsuit in a sworn affidavit filed in mid-May. The woman, who is the younger sister of the friend mentioned in Garner's complaint, said she has a photo of herself with Garner and Hall from the evening in question. She recalled frantically looking around Hall's apartment for her sister and Gardner after they disappeared with Combs and Hall. The then 15-year-old said she walked into a room and saw a man watching whatever Puffy was doing to Liza. The women wrote that she awoke the next morning at a different location where an upset gardener said Diddy had just shown up there and choked her. Hall did not respond to a request for comment. So Diddy and his inflated ego, outsized opinions, and Machiavellian scheming were becoming a problem for his peers. He was very sneaky, pretty much. So um, in 1991, December 1991, he and Heavy D helped organize a celebrity charity basketball game at City College of New York that left nine people 
dead, age 15 to 28, and dozens injured in a stampede, and Diddy did not take responsibility. So no one liked him at Uptown Records. They would call him Satan, and they would flip him off every time they would pass his office. Kirk Burroughs, Bad Boy's co-founding partner and president, Burroughs was fired from Bad Boy in 1997. He had a lot to say. He was interviewed. Burroughs says he once saw Combs attack a woman inside Bad Boy's office in 1994. He and another ex-employee tell Rolling Stone they had to tear Combs off the women after hearing... Screams and the sound of shattering glass. The women decline Rolling Stone request for comment. Felicia Newsom, the first manager of Bad Boy's recording studio, Daddy's House, says she once held Combs back when he was about to beat this girl's ASS. After a fight broke out between two women, I'm holding him by his waist, saying, you need to calm down. This is not your fight. Newsom recalls. As Bad Boy was on the rise, staffers kept Combs' transgressions quiet, whether out of loyalty, fear, or a belief that such incidents were rare. Diddy was a hype man ad-libbing on tracks and making cameos in his artist videos. This guy, Brooke Shire, remember when... Um, the day that Clive Davis called and asked him to start garnering press for Puffy just as if he were the artist. Diddy wanted the spotlight and Clive Davis helped him. Diddy got all the press he wanted when he and Suge Knight got into this whole hip-hop uh, fight. Diddy admired Tupac. He admired his ability to marry street credibility with mainstream appeal. Um, his Him and his whole bad boy team spent the summer of 1993 studying Tupac's single, I Get Around, as a blueprint for a commercial hip-hop record. Diddy was desperate to be taken seriously. Diddy tried to foster a friendship, but Tupac was not interested. Tupac didn't have any kind of respect for Diddy, says 90s hip-hop photographer Monique Bond. Monique, who was close with Biggie and other bad boy artists, said that Biggie and Tupac, they both thought that Diddy was a corny executive. They didn't like him. And Diddy was jealous of Tupac and Biggie's friendship. So after Tupac got on Alive, six months later, Biggie got on Alive. Multiple reports allege Biggie had been preparing to leave Bad Boy shortly before his death. It didn't help that Diddy had been fighting with Biggie's attorneys who were trying to take back the rapper's publishing rights. I will never give it up until I'm dead and my bones are crushed into powder, Diddy told the lawyers, according to the big payback. Biggie was absolutely about to leave Puff, Monique says. I know for a fact because he told me that. Another source adds, everybody wanted to leave Puffy. Everybody leaves him. When Rolling Stone approached Bad Boy about a cover opportunity a few months after Biggie's M-word, Burroughs claims he advocated for the late rapper to take the spot. I was telling Sean, let's make it Biggie. You still have a chance for a cover in the future. Burroughs recalls, he's like, no. Diddy is like, no, he's dead. I'm putting out No Way Out in July. I need to be on the cover of Rolling Stone. That's what Diddy said. Diddy got his cover, and two years later, he acknowledged how Biggie's death had been big business. I think his passing added to the fame. Diddy told Rolling Stone in 1999, at least 2 million of the nearly 5 million copies of No Way Out were sold due to his death, straight up. And that doesn't necessarily feel good, but that's the reality. That's what Diddy said.
becoming a dominant force in the industry only seemed to amplify Diddy's bullying behavior. In April 1999, he barged into the office of Interscope Records executive Steve Stout and allegedly turned violent. Diddy was furious that Stout didn't cut him from a crucifixion scene in a Nas music video before sending it to MTV. He punched me in the face and then he grabbed the phone and bashed me in the head with it. Stout recounted to the LA Times. Diddy privately settled with Stout reportedly for $500,000 and dodged a seven-year prison sentence by a pleading to, re to reduce charge of harassment. A few months later in December, Diddy was arrested after a nightclub shooting in which three people were injured. His newest star, Shine, a.k.a. Jamal Barrow, was convicted of firing the shots and sentenced to 10 years. Barrow was deported to Belize upon his 2009 release. Diddy, meanwhile, was charged with weapons possession and attempted bribery after he and then girlfriend Jennifer Lopez fled the shooting in a linking navigator that reportedly ran 11 red lights. Diddy was facing up to 15 years in prison if convicted. The prosecutor claimed Diddy offered cash to witness after some said Diddy was the shooter. Victim Natanya Rubin has been adamant that Diddy fired the bullet that tore through her nose. Diddy's own driver testified that Diddy offered him $50,000 using a 40000 pinky ring as collateral. If he would say he owned the unlicensed gun found in the SUVs, others have claimed Diddy paid as much as $1 million to shine to keep his silence. After a six-week trial, Diddy was acquitted in March 2001. Let me add, the night of the shooting, after all that thing went down, Diddy left Jennifer Lopez. He left her there. Yeah, he was only saving his own butt. He didn't care about anyone but himself. He was difficult to work for. Employees who wanted to stick around had to learn how to speak puff. Um, he would yell to get his point across and fire employees on a whim. He was very demanding. He was bossy. And no one on his team at Bad Boy spoke back to him. He's always on the edge of snapping and being scary. People did whatever he said to stay in his good graces. And Puffy exploited people's desires to be in those environments. After Diddy's acquittal in the nightclub shooting in 2001, he reportedly headed straight to church. Wow. He later made a less God-fearing visit to the Peninsula Hotel where he was throwing a massive bash to celebrate the verdict. It was there that Anna, a freelance graphic designer working with Bad Boy's marketing team, says Diddy approached her and began to massage her. She's going by Anna because she doesn't want anyone to come after her. So she says... I'm getting touch on my shoulder, my arms, my back. He's like, oh, yeah, you like that? I know you like that. Like, really, really gross. Anna recalls sharing her story publicly for the first time. I was like, no, not so much. And I sort of floated my way out of there. Anna says she avoided Diddy the rest of the night. Weeks later, her boss' girlfriend confided that Diddy allegedly approached the boss the night of the party to solicit me for SEX. Anna says a friend confirmed to Rolling Stone that Anna told her about both the encounter and the proposed arrangement. When they began working together a few years later, the boss did not return Rolling Stone's request for an interview and the girlfriend declined to speak. I felt quite unsettled about this for many years. When people ask me about my days at Bad Boy, it's just overshadowed by his crap, Anna says, adding that 
Diddy treated her as though she existed to accommodate his whims. Diddy often flaunted his sexual encounters, even if underage artists were around to see. A teenage usher briefly lived at Diddy's New York house in the early 90s as a young bad boy protege. Puff introduced me to a totally different set of ish. S.E.X. specifically, Usher recalled to Rolling Stone in 2004, there was always girls around. You'd open a door and see somebody doing it or several people in a room having an orgy. You never knew what was going to happen. K.C. Sheridan, a member of teenage girl band Dream, recalls the group being summoned for a meeting with Diddy to a Beverly Hills Hotel bungalow when she was 15 and awkwardly eyeing a purse and a pair of high heels by the front door as the group waited. After 20 minutes, a bathrobe Diddy emerged from a nearby room. It's like, you can't even keep our innocence. I'm 15, walking into this situation, knowing exactly what he was doing next door, Sheridan says. Not long after, between the spring and fall of 2003, a 17-year-old girl was out one night with friends at a Detroit area lounge when a man in a suit approached and allegedly introduced himself as Diddy's best friend. The man called Diddy and let the girl speak directly with the producer, who was twice her age. The man, alleged to be a uh, former bad boy, President Harv Peer convinced the girl to board a private jet and take a two-hour flight to, to New Jersey, just outside New York City, to meet Diddy in person. According to a lawsuit filed last December by the girl, not an adult, Jane Doe Plantive. Then a high school junior, she was awestruck by the opportunity documenting the trip with photos from inside Daddy's house, where she's been pretending to record a song pointing at Diddy's initials on the wall and sitting on Diddy's lap. She says she was gang all worded that night by Pear, Diddy, and a third unidentified man inside the recording studio. The women claims the men plied her with D-R-U-G-S and alcohol until she was nearly unconscious and unable to consent. As she started to black out, she claims Diddy led her to a bathroom where he removed her skirt and underwear and penetrated her from behind. As she drifted in and out, the unnamed assailant replaced Combs and all worded her from behind as Combs watch, she says. The women alleges Pierre replaced the second man and all worded her too. When the man finished, she fell into a fetal position on the floor in excruciating pain and was later escorted out of the building and flown back to Michigan, she claims. D-R-U-G-S were a consistent part of Diddy's life, uh, Cassie alleges in her lawsuit, claiming he was addicted to prescription painkillers and took ecstasy frequently. She claims he had pills and other D-R-U-G-S out in the open like candy and that he would supply alcohol, ecstasy, cocaine, uh, sedative, GHB, ketamine, and marijuana doing freak-offs, but far from enhancing a party vibe. Cassie and others say these substances only darken his mood. Once Diddy got drunk or high enough, says one frequent party guest in the early 2000s, Diddy would turn violent and loud. He would take his anger out on people. At several points when Diddy was extremely intoxicated, Cassie alleges he beat her. An industry source says they once left a party at Diddy's home because they felt so uncomfortable watching an aggressive Diddy yell at Cassie throughout the night. You could tell in her eyes that she was scared, they said. I'm like, is this normal? Am I tripping right now? Why is nobody saying anything? 
and a 2015 appearance on the Breakfast Club radio show, Diddy described the deal he offers his girlfriends. If I'm in a relationship with you, 25% of your time, you're going to just feel like, oh, man, I hate being here. This guy cheated on me. He lied on me. Combs explained while sitting next to his teenage son, Christian. But then there's this 75% of I'm going to make you the happiest women in the whole wide world. I'm going to be there to support your dreams. I'm going to be there to hold you, listen to you. I'm going to be there to be your best friend. And I promise you'll be, you'll smile the most. You know who I am. This is what it is. Which deal would you choose? He asked. There was one term of the deal Diddy never disclosed, sources say. The women who signed up for it were not allowed to walk away. Damien Vasquez, a former bad boy intern, says after Diddy and J-Lo broke up, Diddy had staffers camp outside MTV's TRL studios with sign to win her back. Cassie claimed that every time she hid, Diddy's network of workers found her and employed her to return, including a bad boy executive who threatened to withhold the release of her music if she did not return Diddy's calls. After Cassie left Diddy, he tried to paint a picture of a heartbroken, hurt man. A source who knew the couple throughout their relationship says when the reality was he's a liar an abuser. That's what they do. Diddy's long-term partner, Kim Porter, who died of pneumonia in 2018, was no exception. Their relationship was tumultuous, according to two sources who claim Diddy physically abused her. I remember Kim used to go through a lot of stuff. Former bad boy rapper Mark Curry says, If you live around him, you get to see the toxic relationship. I think every relationship he had that I experienced around him was like that. Diddy and Kim's first got together in 1994 and dated on and off until 2007. She ended it for good upon learning Diddy had fathered a secret child while she was pregnant with their twin daughters. There were other infidelities, including Diddy's affair with Jennifer Lopez, but Diddy never let Kim truly move on. She told Essence, he still called 50 to 60 times a day. She said, it was like my life was not my own. He was very, very intrusive. In 2000, in the year 2000, Kim's fledgling courtship with late music executive Shakir Stewart enraged Diddy. When the industry gathered for L.A. Reid's wedding in Italy that summer, Diddy went to Stewart's room after the ceremony and allegedly broke a chair over Stewart's head. Stewart's mother and two of his close friends tell Rolling Stone he left him bleeding on a hotel floor in Italy. Stewart's mother, Portia, says he had to have stitches and then Diddy threatened him. I'm going to K-I-L-L-U. That's when I said, you need to get out of this business. This man is crazy. By the mid-2000s, Bad Boy had hemorrhaged several top acts, including Faith Evans, Total 112, Craig Mack, and Foxy Brown. Two decades later, nearly of all Combs artists have left him. Apart from himself, stepson Quincy and son Christian, only Janelle Monae is left on the label. Rolling Stone reached out to dozens of artists who had been signed to Bad Boy to ask about their experiences with the label. Many declined, with one saying, I don't have anything nice to say when it comes to my time with Bad Boy. It was not a good experience and one I really don't want to relive. Those who did speak to Rolling Stone say they felt their time with the label was squandered through lack of direction. Several spent years of bad boy without releasing any music. Mark Curry, who was affiliated 
with Bad Boy from 1997 to 2006 has been one of the most outspoken detractors writing about his dealings with Combs in his 2009 book, Dancing with the Devil, How Puff Burned the Bad Boys of Hip Hop. He says Combs repeatedly promised to produce his solo album, but never gave him a budget. There's different ways you can kill a person. Curry tells Rolling Stone, I've noticed him kill a lot of people's spirits. Not everyone felt the same. Singer, songwriter, Kalena Harper says one of the highs of her life was joining Combs' Diddy Dirty Money group in 2009. She was later invited to work with Combs on the Love album. He was effing cool as ish. She says, adding that artists who blame Combs for the trajectory of their careers may suffer from disgruntled employee syndrome. Years ago, there were whispers that some bad boy A&R executives would expect sexual favors from female artists in exchange for professional attention. I would hear about female artists being asked to do stuff with some of the other male executives recalls one former bad boy staffer. Like, we can make or break your career. What are you going to do about it? Going to HR was useless. If you want your job, you're not going there to complain, they add. In 2022, Danity Kane's Aubrey O'Day said she was kicked out of the group because she wasn't willing to do certain things, not talent-wise, but in other areas. She refused to get specific, but saying the truth was what you can imagine. There was no hashtag me too. She added, you can sign a million NDAs and a million contracts that took away your rights. Asked by Rolling Stone to elaborate, O'Day says, the answer to what happens if you don't do what the executives want. I'm the full-blown effing story of that. Some who left Combs worried he might try to expel them from the industry altogether. Brooklyn rapper Lenise Babs Bunny Wiley of Combs MTV reality show Making the Band says she was blackballed after leaving the label. Bun, the photographer, claims her gigs instantly dried up after winning a lawsuit against Combs in 2000 for withholding a set of Biggie photos from her. She claims a friend at the Fader magazine told her that Combs personally called the office and said if they worked with Bun, Bad Boy would pull its advertising from the magazine. Talk show host Wendy Williams wrote in her 2004 book that Combs spent a lot of money and used a lot of his influence to try to crush me. After she posted an alleged sexual photo of Combs and another man on her website, Combs denied it was him in the photo. And music producer Easy Moby claimed in February that after he challenged Combs over a credit Combs had given himself on the producer's song, he noticed certain people wouldn't deal with him. He's someone you don't want to make an enemy out of, says one former employee of Combs. When people do go against him, that person gets ostracized. For some, the effects of being shunned by Combs were profound. Francesca Sparrow joined Bad Boy Entertainment in 1998, rising through the company to become Combs' right-hand women. But Sparrow alleged in an age and disability discrimination lawsuit that Combs illegally fired her in 2010. She claimed Combs froze her out after she took time to recover from a hip surgery and voluntarily checked into rehab to treat a lapse in her sobriety. Sparrow tried to continue working in the music industry, but opportunities would disappear, a family member says. The alleged blacklisting led to significant 
health issues which brought her to her end. The relative says she was devastated by the way she was treated. She felt betrayed. Sparrow died in 2014. As ex-bad boy president Burroughs put it, Combs never forgets a grudge. If he sees a snag in the sweater, he'll pull. Cassie says in her lawsuit that there were multiple witnesses to her alleged mistreatment, but they were too afraid to cross Diddy. She claimed both Diddy, head of security, and his assistant began to cry when they saw the extent of her injuries. In an open letter published by Rolling Stone, Cassie's friend Tiffany Red wrote that she was present the night Cassie says she was forced to leave her 2015 surprise birthday party for another freak-off with Diddy. Red recalls seeing Cassie backed up against a wall with Diddy cursing her out. She said Ventura, you know Cassie, returned later that night apparently sedated, you know, she was, you know, D-R-U-G-G-E-D, yep, while Diddy screamed at Red, tell your girl she wants some birthday, D-I-C-K. I flew all the way from Miami. She gonna get this birthday, D-I-C-K. Red wrote what she told a visibly angry Diddy to leave Cassie alone. She recalled Diddy ignoring her and driving off with Cassie in a golf cart. Diddy's physical abuse extended to Cassie's inner circle as well. According to her lawsuit, she claims one of her friends obtained a settlement after a physical altercation with Diddy in 2018. After Cassie's birthday party in 2015, a severely intoxicated Diddy allegedly dangled another of Ventura's friend over a 17th floor balcony. Neither friend responded to a request for comment from Rolling Stone. One source who worked with Combs and Ventura says people fail to speak up because Combs doesn't believe in being told no. And if you get caught up in the wrath of that, it can be very dangerous. In her lawsuit, Ventura Cassie says she finally found the strength to leave for good when Diddy allegedly forced his way into her apartment and all worried her in September 2018, the night she met him for dinner to discuss their breakup. To discuss breaking up, she claims Combs pulled off her clothing and assaulted her as she repeatedly said no and tried to push him away. A month later, people reported the relationship was over, citing a source who said Ventura was moving on with renewed focus on her career. So Diddy was the one who contacted People Magazine and said that Cassie was moving on with her career. Though Ventura's alleged hell at the hands of Combs was largely unknown until she filed her complaint, overlapping public claims about Combs' behavior made minor headlines during their decade together. In 2017, Combs was sued for sexual harassment by personal chef Cindy Rueda in a lawsuit that seemed bizarre at the time but has gained renewed scrutiny. Rueda claimed that when she worked for Combs in 2015 and part of 2016, he regularly had her serve dishes while he and his guests were engaged in sexual activity. Ruda claimed Combs once asked her to prepare a meal, then greeted her fully naked and asked if she liked his naked body. One incident in August 2015 allegedly involved Combs ordering Ruda to serve him breakfast in his room and then partaking in sexual activity with Gina Hyun as Ruda dropped the food on a table and fled. The lawsuit ended privately, so I'm guessing they settled. Gina 
Yon, meanwhile, reemerged in 2019 with claims that Combs beat her. In an interview with uh, Yon, said she started dating Combs in 2014 and that he offered her $50,000 to terminate a pregnancy that year. Yon also said Combs shoved her to the ground and dragged her by her hair in 2018 and in a jealous rage once stomped on her stomach. The allegations barely made a ripple and Yon went silent after the interview. Yon declined to comment for this article. I heard somewhere that um, did he pay her off? He paid her $1 million or $2 million to go away. So we'll see. The Detroit area Jane Doe, who sued Combs and Pierre in December, tells Rolling Stone she hopes her lawsuit will hold not just Combs, but also all of those who acted with him, stood silent, and actively covered up his behavior accountable. In her lawsuit, she said her nightmare was not an isolated incident and pointed to another Jane Doe who sued Pierre on November 21st. The woman alleges Pierre groomed and sexually assaulted her when she was his assistant between 2016 and 2017. Then, in early February, Rodney Jones, the Love Album producer, sued Diddy in a 73-page complaint which included unusual elements such as photos of the defendants and redacted names that could easily be deciphered, claimed that Jones worked, traveled, and often lived with Combs while producing nine songs for the projects. Jones claimed to have hundreds of hours of footage and audio capturing Combs, his staff, and his guests engage in serious illegal activity, including the use and distribution of ecstasy, cocaine, ketamine, marijuana, candy, mushrooms, GHB, and 2C. In early April, Yacht Stewart Grace Omake sued Combs and his 26-year-old son, Christian, alleging that Christian, D-R-U-G-G-E-D, and attacked her on board a luxury vessel rented for a 2022 vacation in St. Martin while filming a since-scrapped family reality show for Hulu. According to NBC News, Omake can be heard in an audio recording asking Christian to stop touching her legs. She claims Christian later tried to force her to perform fellatio. In April, premium liquor giant Diageo revealed it paid approximately $200 million to buy the outstanding 50% share of their De Leon tequila brand from Combs, fully dissolving their partnership. In a 2023 court filing, Diageo said that Combs had amassed nearly $1 billion from their 15-year-old relationship. To some, his claim that his brutal 2016 attack on Cassie represented a rock bottom from which he has since recovered doesn't ring true. One source who knew the former couple says the mogul's rage was always on the verge of creeping out. Rock bottom must be his personality, they say. I've never not seen this person. Misa Hilton, the mother of Combs' first son, Justin, had been silent in the wake of Ventura's lawsuit. But after the video broke, she responded by saying, I know exactly how she feels. And through my empathy, it has triggered my own trauma. Hilton declined to comment for this article.
Those who were watching decades ago have long suspected Combs' legacy would end in disgrace. None of this was really a surprise for me," says one of the Howard alums, who had knowledge of Combs' attack on a classmate. "You're already an abuser in college." You were already feeling you had to have certain power over people. Another says Combs must now face accountability. It's time. It is time. As I've said many times, this did not just start it in college. If they go back, 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 I'm sure they'll find other things. So, in a nutshell, he's violent. He's very controlling, abusive, insecure. He'll do anything for fame, power, and money, and he's jealous-hearted. Guys like him are dangerous. Stay away from them, and they need to be locked up. That's it. So, you guys, thank you for tuning in. Please hit the like button. Please subscribe. Please share this video, and I will see you on the next one. Peace.